Namaste. I threw the I Ching today, which is something I do when I have a big decision to make and I'm not sure what the consequences are going to be. The I Ching is so cool because it allows you to see around corners. I mean, seriously, it'll give you a, a totally objective reading on whatever you're thinking about. Sometimes it can be shocking. <laughs> Today's reading was a little shocking, but it also revealed a deep, deep insight into the nature of spiritual love and relationships and all that. So, the reading is, it's called A Loveless Marriage, which sounds kind of, you know, dry and difficult. But this particular line, the changing line, number one, in the hexagram that I threw, is about the way out. When someone is stuck in a loveless marriage, a formal, arranged marriage, really an agreement between their two families more than anything else, which is still current here in the East, the way out is for the man to take a lover and to put it in modern terms uh, without all the flowery language and, you know, um, moralistic, judgmental, sexist terminology, the girl is submissive to them both. Socially submissive to the official wife, but sexually and emotionally submissive to the husband. And this was the ancient arrangement in China among people of rank, you know, people of substance, uh, what the I Ching calls superior men. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, ego, but it's simply those who do their duty to God and society and themselves. So they act in their own best interest by having a presence in the wider society and the culture and in their own family and relations that uh, tends toward the good, the wise, and ultimately towards spiritual realization. So when the superior man has to marry due to family obligations, he is permitted to take a mistress, but not just as a fling, or as a, a temporary relationship, but to bring her into the family, into the house, as a dedicated member of the family. Lifelong commitment from both sides. So this sounds like a pretty good deal <laughs> for everybody, right? And uh, I think implicit in that is that the official wife also gets to philander and play around. <laughs> well, we don't talk about that. Uh, so this is the ancient way. Sometimes the ancient ways are really much better than the way we're doing it now uh, because they're tested by time. If you look in the Vedic tradition as well, this kind of relationship, this kind of arrangement was common among the wealthy Vaishyas, Kshatriyas, and even among the Brahmanas. Yajnavalka himself had two wives, an elder, uh, more mature and developed one, Maitreyi, who was also after his own mind, after his uh, philosophical bent towards Advaita, and another one whose name I forget at the moment, who was like his, his crush, right? <laughs> his romantic partner. So he had the best of both worlds, where his heart and 
mind and body were all nicely taken care of. But at the end, he renounced everything anyway. You know. <laughs> but now, I want to talk about the particular line, the changing line in this reading, because it's extremely significant. It tells that this is actually the principle that makes relationships work is a cautious reserve. That's another way of saying being very submissive, not according to one's own interest, only in the service of the master and the mistress of the house. So to take this metaphor, I've been talking about a metaphor, probably all of the all of the conservatives and liberals are tuned out by now. <laughs> but I've just been talking about a metaphor all this time, okay? Take it easy. This metaphor, when applied to the spiritual life, means that one has to, first of all, practice dualistic religion and develop devotion to the goddess who is the queen? She is the official wife, the public mate, the social partner of the king, who is, you know, Shiva or Vishnu or whatever deity you want to call it. We think of it as Brahman. But the role is the thing, right? He gets the best of both worlds because he has official devotees who are, you know, initiates of a certain lineage and belong to a particular organization, and they have all these qualifications and all these attachments and all these identifications. But they are still devotees. <laughs> Just not yet ripe. So the ripe devotees are those who develop spontaneous love. They don't need any rules and regulations to remember God or goddess. And when they approach through the dualistic path of religion, they get very quick results. Whereas the others who practice rules and regulations based on the scriptures have to eke out their advancement little by little, painfully. It's very difficult because they're so stuck, you know, they're so attached, they're so uh, qualified by all these different qualifications and uh, appellations and titles and designations and so forth. So uh, those who are attracted by spontaneous love aren't into these things, right? which in the higher stages of devotion simply become impediments because they interfere with the um, prime relationship, uh, the essential relationship of the individual with God in the heart. And these come in five flavors, neutrality, servitorship, friendship, fatherhood or motherhood, and conjugal love. So these relationships should be cultivated over years and years with one's ishta devata. And by this is developed one's sva dharma, one's very own religion, uh, one's personal code of relationship with God and goddess. Because you, you have to take them as a couple, as a moiety is the proper term. A moiety is a, a two-ness that is somehow also a oneness. <laughs> like yin and yang, uh, or any pair of opposites. In, out, up, down, far, near, whatever. Those are all called moieties of meaning. But here we have a moiety of emotion. And the emotion is not the kind of, um, how can I say, rigid or stilted, formal emotion 
uh, that's in uh, rules and regulations, you know, social mores and customs and traditions and all of that. Uh, this is a spontaneous happening in real time. Love blooming. You know, uh, I love the Greek word gnosis. Uh, but the, the closest Sanskrit word is bodhi or bodha, which not only means becoming aware of something, realizing something, seeing or understanding something. It also has the meaning of a certain flower blooming and opening up, which I think is a lovely superimposition, <laughs> a lovely metaphor huh? for reaching a new view or new understanding of life that opens up a wider context, a broader meaning to everything. So this happened to me today because of that uh, I Ching. I was ch casting the I Ching, you know, uh, to try to evaluate a new project that I'm thinking of. I want to essentially edit and rewrite Vedanta Sutra for a modern audience. Am I crazy? Am I nuts? Huh? Uh, am I going to live long enough? You know, I mean, I have all these doubts. So I turn to the I Ching, and this particular line indicates that, well, if you are doing this spontaneously, not out of any formal expectations of anybody, <laughs> including yourself, but out of love, basically. If you're doing this out of love of Brahman, love of the self, ananya bhakti, then all right, you will get protection from the king. Who is that? Shiva, Brahman, Nirguna Brahman. Brahman without qualities. Uh, who is the master? He's the Purusha. Uh, he's the Sat Brahman. So he is everywhere and in everything and is aware of everything and can protect everything according to the needs of his work, his mission. Now, there is a, even a sutra, there's even a whole adhikarana in Vedanta Sutra about the Jivan Mukta who has a mission. You know, a lot of Jivan Muktas just sort of kick back and enjoy life, you know. They're like, oh, I made it, now I want vacation, right? I'm going to Disneyland, you know. <laughs> but there's a few who just like have to exercise the compassion to the max. Like Shankaracharya, that's why I look up to him so much. He has the uh, ethical altitude, the moral uh, altitude beyond even most writers of scripture in that he is like giving the highest knowledge, the, the deepest secrets, you know, the most confidential truths openly in his writings and structuring it like a debate where it can be shown how his philosophy defeats all other philosophies. This is wonderful. I would like to bring that out in clean, contemporary, fresh English, uh, but it's too big of a job. I can't even imagine taking it on myself so specifically, the question I asked was, can I use chat GPT? <laughs> to help me with this gargantuan task. And, and uh, just before that, I actually took, uh, if you looked at the last Insights video, I quoted or, or read a long passage from Shankaracharya's Vedanta Sutra or Brahma Sutra commentary. 
And uh, it was very difficult and very dense and very intricate negative logic. I said to ChatGPT, and this is just the free version, right? I said, can you edit and rewrite this so that it's in positive logic, in positive language? And it did. It did a pretty darn good job of it. In fact, it was almost word for word from the version that I edited myself from the original text for that video. Ah, so if I use ChatGPT as my buddy, I can fill any number of pages <laughs> with text. And uh, But really what I want to do is make it into a podcast, maybe even a video series. I don't know. So we have to see how it comes out and how conversational we can make it. Huh? Me and C, CGBT, <laughs> call him C for short. <laughs> hey, Chatty. <laughs> I'm going to try it. I'm going to draft some pieces and make a few tests and run them by you here on this channel and uh, to get your feedback. And uh, should be able to do that within the next couple of days, I think. Ready for have some fun? Oh, Namah Shivaya. <laughs>